Coming up on today's Locked on Bucks, we uh, have the post-game pod from preseason game number two. The Bucks come up short against the Lakers in a preseason game that, at least for the first half, did not feel like a preseason game. Frank and I break down what we saw coming up after this on Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Bucks. I'm Justin Garcia, joined by Frank Madden. And we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen every day. Free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on YouTube as well. All part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Bucks is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet, and you will get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Uh, I said at the top there, Frank, at least for the first half, this did not feel like a preseason game, and I know Doc Rivers talked about it afterwards too, that he liked the intensity that he saw from his team, from both teams, really and i mean you see Giannis with a chase down block on lebron and then what 10 minutes later lebron trying to do the same to Giannis. it felt like it was a regular season game at the midpoint of the year in the first half at least yeah it was sort of this weird like the the Giannis lebron back and forth was interesting because it felt like early in the game like lebron was just like chucking up some quick long jumpers like he's like I, I i can't be bothered to drive to the basket i'm just hucking up a three or a long two and he seemed like he kind of was like all right you made me fly all the way to milwaukee i'm finally playing in a game after you know ducking the bucks for the last three or four years or whatever it is um i'm just gonna throw up some shots and you know get my 10 minutes and get out of here but it did seem like the juices got flowing there especially in that second quarter and Giannis really started to uh spread his wings a little bit uh, somewhat literally at, at, at times um, it felt like Dalton connect kept like getting in his way, driving the basket. And there was one play where um, Giannis didn't finish, but that was, I'd say the, uh, the exception to the rule. Um, so yeah, I mean, Giannis just kind of rolls out of bed and puts up 20 and a half a uh, couple blocks. Uh, LeBron got a T after I think the second one, the first one was an incredible, you know, chase down kind of, vintage Giannis block. And then the the next one, LeBron got kind of sandwiched a little bit and, you know, there was some contact and, and he got attacked, got mad about it. Um, so, but, but I, th I think overall, you know, I mean, we can truly a tale of two halves, right? Bucks only kind of played normal real NBA players for a half. And then the second half was um, a very much the, the, the young, the young Bucks uh, getting their chance to, do whatever it is they do. But the first half, I think 57, 52, I think was the halftime score. So yay, you won the half when the real players played. Um, but I'd say a very uneven half, um, you know, like even Giannis, I mean, what was, I think it was, uh, was he 10 for 18, I think. So, I mean, he, he missed a, a bunch of shots that were not threes and, seemed like you know, he took like a questionable long two and he and LeBron were kind of going at it. So it was kind of one of those things where it was kind of ragged and kind of pick up -y, but there was an intensity to it, which was just yeah. sort of a, a, yeah, a bit of a weird vibe to, to the game. Like they kind of knew it didn't count for anything, but they also were sort of playing with some pride. So, um, but Giannis kind of doing some Giannis stuff. And then Bobby Portis, I, I think he has 39 points in 29 preseason minutes. Now he was an absolute flamethrower for the second straight game. So shout out to Bobby there. It felt like every it felt like this game was just a story of like seven nothing run, eight nothing run, Bucks had a 13 0 run, and then in the fourth quarter, uh, there was I think what a 20 0 run by the Lakers or something yeah. like that. So pretty ragged. And I think, you know, again, probably the nervous most nervous moment was Dame seeming to kind of turn his ankle a little bit in the first quarter. Um, he seemed a little bit slow, even after yeah. you know, when he came back. I again I was happy that he felt good enough to come back. But part of me was just like, why are we even bothering with this? Because yeah. he didn't seem like he was at his best. So hopefully, obviously nothing serious there. And uh, uh, transition defense early, uh, pretty rough. Uh, just getting caught napping. JJ Reddick seemed to have his guys really looking to exploit and transition. So 
It was a preseason game, Justin. That would be my my long story short on this one. It uh, it was a preseason game. Um, yeah, I mean, just the the fireworks from Giannis and LeBron early in this one. Uh, Bobby Portis, as you mentioned, a, a total flamethrower. I think he's what eight of nine in it, and in Arby's night, a five for five on his three pointers as well. Um, but I, I think the other part is you know the, the tale of two halves. Um, we didn't spend so much time talking about it for the obvious reason, but the game against the Pistons, the major disappointment was that your young guys look pretty bad in it, that here's your opportunity and you saw nothing from them. I still um, don't think it's where you need it to be, but at least in the case of AJ Johnson, you saw some stuff and there's, you know, the Bucks fans that are out there that are pretty adamant. He's going to contribute this year. I think we're in line that I, I don't see it, but looking at tonight, I mean, you can just see the flashes in real games or at least preseason games, not so much summer league of, okay, if this develops like the concept of AJ Johnson and what he's going to bring to this team, you got to see it on the floor with that twitch and the quickness that he brings. And just the fact that he's unafraid for his frame to take it into the paint and finish around the rim. Yeah, I mean, uh, if folks didn't didn't get to see the game, which you know, understandable, you're not staying up to watch preseason games. Uh, you know, he he leaks out early. Uh, I mean, I was a little bit surprised, honestly, to see him. Was it in the second quarter? Or was it late in the first quarter? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't realize that Delon Wright was was out. Oh, uh, yeah. We heard shoulder contusion, nothing major, but took a mm -hmm. took a hit you know, on a screen yesterday in practice. So I, I was kind of like, wait, what? AJ Johnson's playing in the first half. Um, and and especially because you know uh, Andre Jackson Jr. Marjon Bochamp they didn't play at all in the first half so it was kind of a weird combination of um, like the regular rotation and then it went straight to like deep bench basically especially to start the third quarter but uh, yeah I thought again you saw him leak out for a dunk for his first sort of official NBA or not again now sorry he did have the one put back uh, uh, against the Pistons but. Let's say his first memorable basket was uh, was a nice little quick dunk uh, in transition, and then kind of got lost uh, in a good way uh, by the defense and and hit a hit a couple threes that were you know, fairly open threes. But as we were saying the other night, that's a huge I mean a huge swing skill for him. I mean if he can hit threes at a decent rate, I mean that that's obviously maybe the most important thing from a offensive perspective that you know, will dictate to an extent, you know, how soon he can actually play. Um, and, you know, in summer league, it kind of came and went. But, uh, but yeah, for him to hit a couple of threes, get that dunk. And then I thought the most impressive one was he loves driving left. He, he's, I believe he writes left hand. I think I remember seeing it. It's like he yeah. writes left handed, but he obviously shoots right. He writes left handed, but shoots right. Um, he does not look like he likes to finish with his left hand. So he will tend to drive left, but then finish with his right hand kind of like reversing shielding with his body. And, and he did exactly that driving right at Anthony Davis um, early in the, I think it was early in the third quarter when the Lakers kept their starters in to start the half or most of their starters start in the second half. And obviously a question for him. We saw a couple moments tonight too, where the, the you know, he gets, he uses that speed, gets close to the rim and then kind of just throws it up there. Uh, but that play against Davis, I mean, he, he got all the way to the rim and, you know, you could see the athleticism, the burst, and to finish, obviously, over a you know one of the best shot blockers, rim protectors in the league, and Anthony Davis, that was like okay, that's that's a legit play, right? <laughs> like random dudes aren't aren't doing that to Anthony Davis. And he hit another three a little bit later. So, yeah, I mean, thirteen points from him, you know, I think probably just important to get a confidence boost at this stage of the you know of his career early into the preseason, especially going one for eight the other day. So certainly the the you know had some big ups and downs uh in vegas and uh, obviously a continuation of that here to start his first preseason but yeah just you're just happy for the guy right i mean it's crazy he looks like he's 15 years old out there. he looks so young and he's obviously skinny uh but you know he's competing and i'd say it's also cool that doc is throwing him out there i mean yeah. he's not babying him and you know they could have put Andre Jackson out there, you know, and said, all right, okay, Andre, you sort of bring the ball up and you be the quote unquote point guard here. Uh, Cause we don't trust the, you know, him or Ryan Rollins, obviously is, is older. 
whatever it might be. But yeah, no, just, hey, go out there and make mistakes. But, you know, I think with a guy like that, you want him making errors of commission, not omission, you know, like trying to do do stuff rather than kind of being afraid of the ball. And I think when the Lakers went in their zone, like he, you could tell he didn't really know how to attack that and just kind of was like, all right, I, I was like, oh, I can't get the ball into the, to the, to the nail. So I'm going to dish it over side to side. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't look, he's not going to be a high level lead guard anytime soon, but I think maybe the path for him early in his career, especially if he can be a solid to good three point shooter is, being maybe a little bit more of an off the ball guy, right? Can, can he defend well enough here in his first and second years that he's not hurting you there? And then, you know, does that burst uh, able to push the ball in transition and, you know, maybe take an open three and hit that, or, you know, make a random playoff, you know, when, when things are breaking down, right? I think that's probably his path to minutes at some point. And again, how optimistic you want to be about when that happens, that's kind of, you know, up to you, but, uh, but yeah, that was a really nice, definitely a nice change of pace after the game on Sunday when, you know, everybody under the age of 30 <laughs> looked pretty terrible. Um, it, it's a preseason game, so it's, there's not a whole lot of wholesale takeaways here, but there were a couple of things I think worth pointing out and questioning should we keep an eye on this or is this something to really monitor for this team or with this team as we move into the regular season? We'll get into that conversation coming up after the break here on Locked on Bucks. Time to talk to you about our friends over at Game Time. You've heard us mention how easy they are. The best ticketing app there is in the industry, whether you're checking off a stadium or arena tour in unfamiliar venues where there's a lot of handy features on the game time app. You can see a panoramic view from in your seat, especially helpful if it's an arena or venue you haven't been to before. See what that experience is going to be like all within the app. Toggle on the uh, all-in pricing feature and you can see exactly what those tickets will cost you with no surprise fees once you get to the checkout and your tickets come with the lowest price guarantee, where Game Time will credit you 100, 110% of the difference if you can find those seats cheaper elsewhere. Best of all, your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNBA to score $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. And again, create an account and redeem that code LOCKEDONNBA. L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. So uh, a couple of the things that we didn't see a high volume of it, but you noticed a couple of times early in the game, and I don't remember who it was that we heard talking about this after a practice the other day. Um, I think it was actually Doc who was talking about one of the things that uh, Rajon Rondo kind of insisted on this team doing and even stopped the practice a couple of times when he was the, uh, what was the verbiage they used, the guest coach out there in Irvine, um, of a number of times seeing the Bucks come up with a rebound and looking for Giannis to slowly walk the ball up the floor, or whoever it was. And Rajon Rondo would just halt things and say, no, just get it and push it up the floor. Figure it out when you get in the half court with Giannis and attack there. And I think in the first quarter, we saw that a couple of times with Gary Trent, of all guys, that he was the guy that would get the ball and just, no, let's go attack. And he was also the guy that found Giannis on a few of those outlets when it was just the two of them in the half court. So that's one thing. I am very curious to see if this is one of the changes that kind of sticks with this team of, nope, let's look to push it. And the other piece of that was, again, it's a preseason game, so we'll see where it goes from here. But it was primarily Dame when Giannis and Dame were on the floor. And I know Doc talked about the rules of when one will bring it up the court versus the other. Um, but based on the eye test and what I saw, Dame was primarily the, the guy that was bringing the ball up the floor, even on rebounds. And when Giannis was out there kind of initiating things. Yeah. And I, I mean, again, like on the one hand, I always sort of, it's like if, if I'm trying to choose between the ball in Damian Lillard's hands or Giannis at hands, it's like, ah, these are, these are pretty good options to have. Right. You know, <laughs> 
I can feel pretty good about this either way. Um, you know, I think I think the numbers and the eye test has has kind of shown like you know when Yana, especially without Dame, is the ball is in his hands. You know, the offense, especially if Chris is not out there, the offense generally isn't that successful. And yeah. again, I think that somewhat speaks to also just the lack of depth of talent around the Bucks, especially on the Bucks beyond Damon, especially Chris, um, from a scoring perspective. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I it's, it's always going to be a push and pull with those two guys, you know, there is only one ball, fortunately pick and rolls exist. So, you know, we obviously saw them trying to exploit that a bit. I, you know, I don't know that we saw anything dramatic in that regard. We still saw Giannis initiating a fair amount of offense. <clears throat> um, and, you know, making plays the way that Giannis makes plays. He had a great interior pass to Bobby Portis for a finish yeah. at one point. Um, but it was funny, as you mentioned, Gary Trent, and, you know, he had the, a really nice pass in transition, catching Giannis streaking up the middle for, for a dunk, and then um, and kind of another, like, semi-transition type play, found him for another dunk later. And the cynic in me immediately thought, wow, I think that's two more great passes for Giannis dunks than Malik Beasley had all of last year. <laughs> Which so apologies to bees. I'm. I, well, I've never. I, I mean, I don't. I don't want to be a bees hater, but like, you know, and, and Gary Trent. Let's be honest. I don't want to be, be a only... bees hater, but I'm only playing the cards I've been. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Players. But um, you know, Gary Trent not exactly known for his playmaking either. As he's his career high in assists is like 2.0 in a season, or maybe a couple years ago. So let's you know temper our enthusiasm too much, but. Um, this is always a good litmus test, right? I always like to look for this, like, you know, when, especially when new guys show up, do they look to get Giannis the ball in transition? The Malcolm Brogdon test? Yes, yes, exactly. The Malcolm Brogdon <laughs> test. The guys I always think of who are really good at it, I'm curious. Okay, so I've got a few guys in, in my head. Two guys spring to mind is guys who were always very good at getting Giannis the ball, like as a trailer in transition or just looking for him in transition, which again is like the most obvious thing to do. But the two guys I always think of, Earlier in Giannis's career, Jet, yeah. Jet was new. Like you know, you gotta arguably the best from my gotta, memory. You gotta yeah. get the ball to Giannis, right? I mean, that's just like good self-preservation slash job insurance. If you get the best player the ball, the most dominant transition player maybe of all time, like maybe get him the ball in transition. Uh, the other guy on the other end of the career spectrum was Dante. Dante oh, maybe yeah. more because he was super young and deferential. Um, he also always made sure to get Giannis the ball in transition. Um, I'm, I think you probably put like Andre in that class too, but Andre will pass to anyone so that you know he doesn't have to try to shoot. Although tonight, pretty <laughs> pretty rough offensive performance from Andre, but um, he did actually try to dribble and finish at the rim, yeah. which is a combination of things he almost never does, right? Because he's always just passing out when he dribbles. Um, he may never do it again after the he, results. <laughs> he may never do it again. Yeah, not – did he? So he got that alley oop, which like he, yeah. it like bounced out, and oh, I, yeah. I think Eric's was asking like if I didn't see a replay, but like did it? Or maybe it was Ryan. Or Ryan, Con I, somebody, somebody commented like it looked almost like he jumped, and his like body was kind of angled like horizontally, and it yeah. looked almost like it bounced off of his chest. Oh, his chest, yeah. Which I've never seen that happen. I've seen like guy, the ball bounce off guys' heads. Yeah. And not go through the basket, but that would be a new one if he got horizontal and bounced the ball off his chest. So I don't know, intrepid listeners slash viewers, go uh, go let us know if you if you saw a replay of that. Well, between that and then the what in the fourth quarter, the play where Tyler Smith was trapped Ugh. and tried to throw it off of I can't remember who it was on the Lakers, <laughs> and nearly bounced the ball into the net in doing so. There was a lot in this game. I think, I don't I think there I'm were saying. I think there were three plays where two plays where uh, Tyler Tyler and uh, and uh, AJ had to inbound the ball to each other and <laughs> were not successful. And another play where they like had to run a handoff or something and they had another turnover. So I know those guys have spent a lot of time together, but it has not translated into inbound chemistry yet. Um, so. A little bit of work left to do there. Uh, spent a lot of time together, as in they played together in AAU in ninth grade, and now they've just been paired up as first round draft picks. So it's not as though these are lifelong best friends here. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, if we just look at the second half, so like the first half takeaways, not a whole lot of them. You like what you saw. Uh, it didn't feel like a preseason game for all the, the reasons that we went through. And, you know, what you're seeing from the starters with Torian Prince, overall you like. I'm still very curious to see as we get into the regular season what the shot diet for Brooke Lopez looks like, especially given some of the comments that he made at media day and working on his ball handling. And, and he's still going to space the floor, but that's not going to be the only thing that he does. And I think he just took one three tonight. And there was a handful of plays where, I mean, it was the prototypical Brooke is open and he's five feet behind the line. He's just going to heave this. And he did it. So I do wonder how much of an emphasis that's been, but in the second half with the young guys, um, I mean, we've talked about a few of them. Really the only one I think worth mentioning from what we saw was A.J. Johnson. Otherwise, you either didn't see enough or it's still more of the, uh, I don't know here. Like, what what do you make of the fact that, you know, we talked about how early A.J. Johnson came into the game. Andre Jackson Jr. didn't come in so late. And I know he had surgery after – um, summer league, and that was kind of bandied about as, well, they're taking it easy with him because of that. I, I don't know that that's the case. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because last year, Andre was kind of the guy that everybody sort of loved his energy and wanted to find more time for him to get on the floor. And it's been interesting, you know, abbreviated summer league, and even if he had played more, I mean, as we were talking about the other day, the problem with really most of the Bucks sort of bench guys, young guys, but especially, uh, especially Andre, their games don't scale up. Like they have to be playing with, with good veteran players who can do stuff with the ball. Cause Andre doesn't want the ball. Right. Um, so in an ideal world, you know, he's only out there with Dame and, you know, yeah, I don't know if Giannis is the, the best compliment, but you love his energy. Uh, but yeah, get him out there with Dame and Chris Middleton and all he's having to do is run around and get offensive rebounds and set screens and do durable handoffs and look for alley-oops. Like, yeah, he can do that. But um, it, it is interesting. It seemed like uh, in, in the comments and I, I posted a tweet tonight, which um, I basically the comment was, you know, how unusual it is for a guy who can handle the ball a bit. Right. I mean, coming out of college, like he, he played point guard ish at times for UConn and they won a national championship. So it's not yeah. like, you know, he was just screwing around on some bad team, but you know, he handled the ball a fair bit for UConn. He certainly has like, you know, open gym handles, right? Like he can dribble the ball up and up in the floor and transition, do things like that. Um, but for a guy who like can handle the ball a bit and obviously has just nuclear athleticism, I, I just, it's just so bizarre how he just doesn't, you know, doesn't know how to get to the rim and, and attack. And, you know, I, I went back literally over the summer at one point and watched like a half hour of like, you know, scouting report, highlight real stuff of him in college. And, you know, I can count on like two fingers, the number of times where it was just like, he'd got the ball three point line and like dribbled in half court and got to the rim and, you know, not even dunked, but just laid it up. Cause he, he just, you know, he's always looking to pass. And some of that's unselfishness, but some of that is, I think he, as we saw tonight, he, he did try to actually go to the rim a few times, including in transition once. And, you know, it's whatever it is, million dollar move and, you know, five cent finish or whatever. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because I don't think the environment of playing with a bunch of other young guys that can't do anything offensively is really going to, you know, bring out the best in Andre either. But he's just got to be so good defensively to yeah. – you know, be able to overcome the offensive limitations. And again, like a lot of it's mitigated yeah. if he's just kind of standing in the corner of the dunker spot or whatever and not having to do much. But I mean, you know, like, if that's what his kind of offensive game is, then um, what is his ceiling as a player, right? Is it ninth man, eighth man? Obviously the hope was that he could be something more. The hope was that he could yeah. be, you know, like a legit, wing stopper type you could bring at least bring off the bench if even if you're not starting him um so you know on the one hand it's like well he's it's only his second year but it's not like he was 19 or something coming coming out like what is he 23 or something like that now i mean you know the clock that 
the timeline from like fun young player to let's not pick up his you know third year option like it, it's a pretty pretty short trip between those things and you know look no further than Marjan Bochamp right first couple months of Marjan's career randomly getting minutes flashing nice stuff everybody's super excited about Marjan why aren't why isn't he starting why isn't he playing more you know like blah 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 and you know now here we are like arguing about whether or not he's even going to get his option picked up so you know it's it's a slippery slope and you know with these guys like they again like Andre's future is not going to be dictated by a couple preseason games um but this is why this is why for him I was disappointed he he didn't play until later in the game because then it just became yeah. kind of a throwaway you know um so so we'll see I I mean again I I think a lot of like kind of his DNA is is things that you think coaches would love so if he can't beat you know AJ Green uh and you know so, some of these like aging bets for minutes not exactly a great sign but We'll see, right? Two game, two two preseason games down, two more to go. Hopefully, he can flash a little bit more here for the remainder of the preseason. Otherwise, you know, again, people people are going to get impatient quickly. Well, there's a, a couple of things to piggyback off of that. We'll get into that uh, conversation about the pecking order with this team, especially on the wing, coming up next year on Locked On Bucks. Time to talk to you about our friends over at FanDuel. As NFL fans know, they can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get the hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more, and do it all on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Doesn't even have to win. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. To get started, just head over to FanDuel.com. Yeah, I mean, that was the interesting part, was just seeing where he kind of came in and, and the pecking order of things. Um, it was one of the reasons why, uh, and granted, I don't know that, um, that my guy really did much either, but... <laughs> One of the reasons why I kind of shifted, if we're looking at young guys that you could get something from this year, I shifted my attention to Chris Livingston um, was because number one of kind of the breakdown of guys that the Bucks have at the depth chart, there could be an opportunity for not necessarily Chris Livingston, but somebody like him to fill that role if, you know, you – or without Giannis for a week or two in the regular season, or Bobby Portis goes down and you have to fill that role. With Andre, I mean, you have A.J. Green. You have, in theory, Marjan Beauchamp. You have DeLon Wright that you brought in. You have Gary Trent Jr. You have all of these guys. Pat Connaughton, who's uh, been a regular for Doc Rivers so far in the preseason. There's just so many guys in front of him. And look, I, I get all of those names that we listed have flaws, but it, it just seems like the flaws with Andre are much more severe and the good pieces. It's, it's not an elite skill set like AJ green has in that shooting. It, like in theory, he's a good defender, but he has the foul issues and he's mostly a motor guy that it has to be like, you kind of made the point before. Um, I think, Last year, there were comps thrown around, but he has to be like Matisse Thybul on steroids in order for it to make sense on the floor. Yeah, and uh, I mean, we, we I, I, it's one of those things, like, is he even going to play enough for us to feel like we've gotten a large enough sample size? And, and that's, yeah. that's the problem is we get into sort of these chicken or egg problems with these young guys who have a lot of veterans ahead of them. And obviously you don't want injuries to force you to play them, but that's probably what it's going to take to, to get extended looks at probably, I think there's a chance Andre would get some chances to play, you know, so he'll get some chances to play um, regardless, but you know, somebody like Marjan, like is Marjan going to play unless there's like multiple injuries? Like uh, at this point, I probably would not expect it. So so, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing, right? Like trying to kind of read the tea leaves here in the preseason is is also difficult. You know, what is, again, as you're saying, what does A.J. Johnson getting early reps mean? What does Marjan and Andre not playing until the second half mean? 
hey, maybe maybe that's just Doc saying like, you know, you guys sucked on Sunday, and I don't like I don't like the way you played, and so you're you're getting knocked down a couple pegs for at least a night um, because it was pretty weird. The the third quarter starting lineup, what, what was it? It was AJ Tyler Smith, AJ Green, Pat Connaughton, and number eighteen. <laughs> Which is the official nickname for number eighteen? I'm I'm gonna see. I'm I'm curious if he survives training camp, um, I, and if I ever have to even say his name out loud because uh, I don't really know what sort of led them to use their their <laughs> second two way on number eighteen, but it, or their third two way on number eighteen. It feels like they maybe they just kind of got sick of having to look for somebody, and they're just like, hey, this guy was in the NBA for another team not long, not so long well, ago. Well, and there's a big guy. And, and the other big guy that they have in training camp has thoroughly outplayed him so far. So I don't, I don't. Oh, know that. now we're going to a direction I like. <laughs> this is Liam Effing Robbins, definitely so, my favorite preseason storyline for the Bucks. I mean, there was a stretch before that twenty to nothing run where you were thinking we're going to win this game, and we're going to have a post game interview. And I'm guessing it's the preseason. It's not going to be Dame. It's not going to be Giannis. <laughs> It's not even going to be Gary Trent Jr. And I started to think, like, are we going to get Liam Robbins for a post game interview? And was plotting out, like, oh man, this is going to be it. And then they lose. But um, I mean, through two preseason games, he's leaps and bounds in front of 18. <laughs> and if you're telling me you have to keep a big on your two way, Liam Robbins gets that two way contract. Yeah. I it's funny, and I honestly, when he checked into the game on Sunday, I had never really. Who is this guy? I had never. I I knew his name, but I didn't. I had not read up on, like, any did any background research on him. Like, what kind of? How does he play? And when he blocked a couple shots on Sunday, I was like, wait a minute, this guy's a, like, a rim protector. Like, <laughs> you know, um, I I immediately when I, when he when he comes in. So and and again, if you didn't watch the game, and haven't seen Liam Robbins. He was born in Waukesha. Have we figured out like if he actually spent any time as a kid in Waukesha? It I don't sounds know. Like he, and that's another reason why like I was. It, so. It's another reason. Yeah, I, I think it was like maybe very briefly. That's another reason why I was hoping uh, we would be blessed with him as a post game interview. But <laughs> I think he was essentially what raised in Iowa, basically, yeah. and just went to three colleges, which is the norm now. Um, but if you just showed a picture of Liam Robbins to any Bucks fan that had never seen him before. And I think you tweeted about this too. You just assume like, Oh, that's pretty cool. We brought over a, a center from Australia. <laughs> like, yeah. We're going to get Kane. Our friend Kane Pittman's going to come yeah. back and like, you know, be talking about Liam Robbins on ES for ESPN Australia. It's going to be great. Uh, he's got the like trash intentionally trash haircut, you know, with like, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like, no, yeah long in the front and long in the back and short on the sides. Like I, I, there's gotta be, it's a like a hybrid mullet with more style. Yeah. Yeah. It's there are, it's an intentional thing. He didn't look like this in college. Um, no. I, I looked back at some photos. I was actually, it's funny. I, I went and watched some, <laughs> I was looking for highlight packages and he had like a 27 point game when he was at Minnesota and our, our dear friend of the pod, Lisa Byington was calling the game. So it was kind of funny. It was like Lisa calling, this huge 27.5 block performance from Liam Robbins. Um, I actually didn't become aware of him until I think a couple weeks ago, he went with Chris Middleton to the Packer game. And there was a picture of Chris Middleton yeah. at the Packer game. And um, <laughs> I think Chris had like a Jersey, like a number 19 Jersey or something that he was like, they were going to give away or something. And I was like, seeing this, I was like, is this like a picture from 2019? And they're giving like a, jer a Bucks Jersey for the year to somebody or something. And anyway, it was very confusing. Um, but Liam Robbins was standing there and I, I, I had no idea who it was. I honestly, I thought he was like one of those, you know, tall assistants that gets brought in. Like the, the guys that are six, seven who aren't really that good, but played in college and, you know, they want to become assistants and they can at least give, you know, contests to bigger players. And when they're doing like, you know, pregame warm ups and stuff, that's literally what I thought Liam, who Liam, who Liam Robbins was, but no, he's actually on the preseason roster. And I believe the the herd acquired his returning rights, so mm. presumably he will be up with the herd. Yeah. Although, gosh dang it, Justin, if we can't start a campaign to get him that sec that third two way spot, that I that'll mean. be my mission here in preseason. I think what did he have? He had four points, a couple blocks, 
I think four fouls, a couple of fouls, <laughs> five on rebounds, bone to crushing moving screens yeah. that he sent. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a total goon. He played 13 minutes, <laughs> total goon. Had a great block that uh, was called a foul, and Doc challenged it, and uh, it was overturned. So he got the got the block. Um, had a couple of very chippy fouls, so uh, not afraid to mix it up. Um, so yeah, like you know, maybe he's got a a future. You know, no Thanasis, so maybe you know, bring it on the two way. Maybe he can come in when stuff gets out of hand, and you know, throw some forearm shivers and. Um, is the the kind of dirt ball off the bench or something like that? He, he looks like he could play the part, but uh, but yeah. So big big Liam Robbins fan. Shout out to Liam, and uh, I mean yeah, SEC Defensive Player of the Year. So yeah, um, the guy, there's some pedigree there. I'm pulling for him to uh, to get one of the two way deals, assuming one of those opens up. Um, we've kind of ventured into a strange area with the pod <laughs> here, but just like rounding it out with what we saw from the young guys and even uh, making the suggestion of, can we just get Liam Robbins that other two way contract? If there's one guy of those young guys that is not on the roster when the season starts, who do you think that's most likely to be? Sorry, you're saying one of the guys that is not, not necessarily the two way guys. Like we're including everyone, Marjan and the, the deadline day of what three weeks from today, I think it is. Uh, anything else that they could possibly do, uh, Frank? I don't know if you saw this. Everybody's favorite part of the season came very early for us last night, and that was the PJ Tucker sweepstakes that the Bucks are apparently <laughs> leading. Um, so of course, we could just trade player X for PJ Tucker, and then we'll solve all the problems. Um, but if they did that, it would presumably be. We're going to trade one of these guys we've lost faith in to recoup a draft pick, and then we open up a roster spot, and we brought back P.J. Tucker at uh, his ripe old age. So, um, and, to yeah, be clear, I mean, and to be clear, P.J. Tucker would have to be bought out, right, because the Bucks yeah. can't trade for him. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they could trade Bobby Portis for him, but I, yeah. I, I the Clippers the Clippers may be a first apron team anyway, which, so they couldn't yeah. even do that one. Yeah. Basically, the Bucks can't trade with, like, half the league directly because I have to leave different. can't trade with yeah, half the league, yeah. basically. Um so which guy is most likely to be on the outs? Um I mean like one thing to keep in mind with the Bucks where they are from like a tax and apron perspective to like cut a guy is really not feasible yeah. guaranteed, right? So um so I think again that would mean then for somebody like Marjon it would have to be a trade. Yeah. I don't think any I mean can you get a second round pick for Marjan at this point? Like, like, I don't, I don't even going to trade for him when they know, yeah. well, if you're not picking up his option, we can sign him in the off season. There's not going to be a lot of people bidding for his services, at least at a high cost. Yeah. I just, so I, I don't think he has, I don't think, and, and if, if Marjan could have fetched, you know, a pick, I think there's a good chance he would have been would have traded, been you know, yeah. right on draft night or, or whatever it might be. So, um, so I don't think, I don't know that any of those guys are are fetching a draft pick at this point. Um, I mean, obviously, I, like AJ could fetch a draft pick or something, like that, but I'm talking yeah. about you know Marjan and um, Andre. Yeah, Andre. you could probably get a pick for I guess, yeah. but um, but I mean, I think Marjan's obviously the guy that you know, and and he had a couple actually solid moments tonight offensively. Hit a hit a couple yeah. shots like. One of them kind of out of a pick and roll, created some space and, and finished. So he had a couple of very solid moments and then it followed up with not so very solid yeah, moments. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say, I mean, I would look at the two ways just because you can recycle them pretty yeah. much without conf- consequence. There's no impact on your tax bill or anything like that in terms of what you do with your two ways. So, um, so I mean, on the one hand, the Bucks having only three big men basically on the entire roster. I mean, I guess unless you consider Tyler Smith a big man, but he's kind of not really. Um, so, I mean, I, I get the, th- I guess the theory with number 18 was we need a big guy who's played in the NBA before who can just, you know, in, in some emergency scenario where like Brooke and Bobby are both out, we could potentially have a warm body at seven feet that could, you know, just pick up some fouls or something. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, it just seemed like a, pretty unimaginative pick right the guy's not he's not really a good defense he doesn't have a rep as a good defender and he can't shoot yeah. so he's basically just like a 
it's like a very weird throwback skill set because he's kind of just like a good pick and roll close range finisher, even though he's not super athletic. So how that got him back to the NBA is, is a little weird, but um, some yeah. of the sequences we saw uh, tonight reminded you of high school basketball where you play against <laughs> that team and like they have a starting center because he's the tallest kid in the school where you're like, Oh, like this is doesn't, why you're playing. Doesn't like to play basketball, but right. just, you know, peer pressure. Yeah. And like, even when they made the signing, um, I know he played, uh, what, 30 games with the Wizards last mm-hmm. year? Um, I did not remember him. I assumed no. it was, oh, we brought somebody in from overseas. And then seeing even the comments from Wizards fans of, like, this guy's terrible, good luck. <laughs> like, oh, wow, this is getting pretty dark. Yeah, I, I immediately uh, looked for, like, if there was some, like, agent backstory. <laughs> um, and... He he's you immediately rep- searched like is he represented by Mark Bartles? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he, I don't think he is. Like he's got some. He's rep. His agent is Arturs Kalnidis of Baltic Sports Agency. <laughs> I'm I'm not aware of there being any uh, practical, you know, up, any any angle here uh, for <laughs> for what the Bucks would need to get on the good side of Arturs Kalnidis. But um, but yeah. So maybe I would say him um, and. <laughs> Of course, now I'm going to be rooting for uh, for Liam Robbins, our dear friend, to yeah. uh, to somehow figure out his way to uh, to get to get into this. But uh, but we'll see. Um, I don't know. I'm not I'm not holding my breath, but uh, it would be it would be fun if uh, if Liam <laughs> Robbins sniped his way into a two way spot. At least he does the sort of things that a, you know, low rent big man, like a big man does. Yeah. Like he, and and he actually shot some threes in college. So he took one tonight. Yeah. He took one tonight. It didn't, didn't look so good, but uh, (laughs) at some point maybe he will make a three pointer. Uh, So if nothing else, the good people of Oshkosh will get their Philip Liam Robinson this season. So um, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see if Milwaukee does. I'm I'm less optimistic for Milwaukee, but Uh, it would be uh, a Stanley Moody's obviously safe because he was the first signing the Bucks made this yeah. offseason. And, and he's um, been a – I mean, he actually yeah. like was yeah, – yeah. had legit moments for the Pistons last year. Yeah. And, I mean, again, he's one of the guys that you look at and you see, okay, like I, I see there's something here if you can harness it and he can keep working on it. Like, yeah, I see – potentially a rotational player in this down the road. Um, I think the last thing I have from this game was we talked about what Gary Trent Jr. did pushing the pace for this team offensively. And again, um, like we heard it a lot from Lakers fans about Torian Prince. And I've heard it from some people as well about, oh, I wouldn't be so sure about Gary Trent being uh, this and that offensively and just trying to communicate the point of guys i don't know that you actually watched malik beasley last year outside of taking three-point shots everything else was a total adventure and defensively um we saw the bucks in the passing lane a lot tonight and a lot of it was gary Trent jr uh after the game doc rivers was very very high on gary Trent jr and went as far as to say he thinks he's been typecast as a scorer only, but he's much more than that, and he can really defend, and he's really starting to show that right now. Um, do you believe that, or does this start to feel like – I remember a different coach telling me the exact same thing last year about the guy that Gary Trent Jr. replaced. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Um, so our friend Eric and, and Nate Duncan were doing the, their Bucks season outlook. Yeah. And Nate framed it as, you know, Gary Trent is sort of like set up to fail, basically, because even if he's a better defender than Lee Beasley or, or it's a solid defender, enough. it's it's just hard. Like he's, you know, like putting him as your like wing stopper guy in the starting five is just, you know, when your ambitions are a championship, 
how is he going to live up to that? It's, it's just a, a huge ask. And I think that's, it's fair. You know, I, I mean, we'll see, we'll kind of see how things go. I think the parallels with um, the Cavs are interesting. Greg Buckner coming over, having been the defensive coordinator there to being now the defensive coordinator here. Eric had a really good article at the athletic, you know, asking doc about sort of the backstory of Buckner coming yeah. from Cleveland to Milwaukee and basically you know, his best friend was JB Bickerstaff. So yeah. JB never allowed him to be interviewed previously when, uh, when doc was interested in, in trying to get uh, Greg Buckner. So, you know, he's here now um, and has experience basically playing with two non-defensive guards and two really good defensive big men and getting, you know, elite defense out of groups like that over the past, you know, couple of years in Cleveland. So, you know, you kind of cross your fingers that they can replicate some of that. Um, I, I mean, I, I think there is still a chance at the box. And again, are they going to be a top five defense? I'll, I'm definitely not going to bank on that. Yeah, I wouldn't put money on it. But... Is, is there a chance they could be, you know, I don't know, eighth or ninth defensively? Like, yeah, like that could happen. Like, I don't, I don't think that's crazy. Could they be slightly below average? Yeah, that could happen too. You know, I think probably, I think the reasonable hope would be maybe they're, you know, 11th, 12th or something yeah. like that. And then your offense is awesome. Maybe you get some, you know, opponent shooting luck that, that helps you. They had that for a fair bit last season. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. But I think regardless of what happens, they need Gary Trent to defend with a lot of energy and to hit, you know, some threes and probably, you know, be a guy that can absorb some shots with second unit groups. Um, you know, he doesn't have a great track record being an efficient scorer, especially you know, when he's not taking threes. But, um, but we'll see. Hopefully you can insulate him from having to do too much just by virtue of hopefully Dame Giannis Chris being, being healthy. So, um, yeah, he's obviously kind of maybe the most obvious sort of swing player. Probably Chris, for injury reasons, you would kind of look at as like the the biggest X factor. But I'd say Gary Trent probably right right there with Chris for for slightly different reasons. Yeah, and I suppose to a lesser extent to Torian Prince, um, which the fan base for the Lakers inside the arena tonight would be the first to tell you this guy sucks. Uh, we played him too much, yada yada yada. But I think the point. Eric made this point with Nate and we've all made it all along this off season is are we saying he's an elite defender and the best you could have gotten for the resources the Bucks had he was the best you could have gotten but it's more the point of I don't think you guys are fully comprehending or realize just how bad it was last year in what they're replacing so it's undoubtedly better than where it was a year ago now the question is is it good enough? Yeah, and I, I still think the. It, it's so weird looking back at the, at last season, the part that I still sort of have the hardest part reconciling is. You know, Griff sort of had just like a, roll it out and do whatever kind of approach to the offense, and the offense was really elite for that first half of the season. Obviously, the schedule is really soft too, um, and then. You know the defense was better with with Doc, but the offense was really mediocre. And I, I don't know, like I don't. It's not like Giannis fell off. Um, you look at a lot of their peripheral stats. I mean, a lot of the stuff was pretty similar. So I think you know I always sort of worry a bit with Dame that changing the foul call, sort of the way the fouls were were called, yeah. did change over the course of the season, and his free throw weight went went way down, popped back up a little bit towards the end. Um, I think that that's a kind of an no, underrated I, thing that gives me some pause about the box offense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just the fact that again, like they're so dependent on Dame Giannis, Chris to create shots and they just don't have, you know, they need like the, the 2027 20, version of AJ Johnson right now, right? Like the more fully formed version of AJ Johnson to be kind of like a speed merchant shot creator guy. But obviously at his age, like, you know, I would say we're, we're not assuming you're going to get that. And Delon Wright is, as good of a kind of solid two-way guy as he is like, you know, he obviously has offensive limitations. So, um, so yeah, I mean, again, yeah, I think you, if you can be 10th defensively, 11th defensively, whatever, um, and then be really, really good offensively, but I don't know. I mean, it, they should be a great offense, but there's, there's a lot of great offenses now too, yeah. right. To be in the class of, 
you know, a Dallas, an Indiana is, is not easy. I mean, the, the bar is very high. Yeah. yeah. Boston, the bar to be an elite offense is really high. Um, but I think, you know, again, like what you saw last year, that when they played the best players, they were great. And so I think probably what you saw was the lack of structure kind of shown through more when yeah. you did not have these kind of normal groups or your top end groups on the floor. Whenever you had the bench units, the cracks really began to show in the kind of foundation, which again goes back to the summer when you hire a guy who obviously like never got the buy-in that was needed. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a good point on Dame and that's obviously going to determine a lot. I think he got it, it's a preseason game, but I think he got two of those calls. Uh, I know he got at least one in, in a game where both teams starters combined for nine free throws. He took three of them. Um, but that's going to be important because it did tail off. I know Eric, I think he had a piece about this too, that, you know, Dame talked about the conditioning and part of wearing down in, it wasn't just the way that the the calls were stipulated and changed at the midpoint of the season. It was partially his conditioning to an absorbing contact that he felt was a piece of it. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see if that's going to be the case because, you know, to your point, Dame needs to be very, very good. Um, you, I think the clearest recipe for this team, elite offense. And, you know, I've, kind of said all along if you can finish 12 i'll take it defensively if you obviously better great um but dame's going to determine a lot of that uh any final thoughts on what we saw from this game big takeaways other than liam robbins and uh, how we get him on the roster moving forward <laughs> as we two, prep for the bulls two games down two to go the the regular season is drawing drawing nigh so um well yeah i mean i, I do have to point out too i'm, I'm one of the few that I, look it, i'd be all for a 12 game preseason schedule because we're paid per game by the league so i mean the more the better i know the players don't feel that way and, and others don't but we could do 30 preseason games and i'd be down for it i think i think i saw the lakers are doing six, six preseason yeah. games and the bucks are doing four which i don't know it, maybe that's like the last vestige of sort of the, like you hear the stories about how when Don Nelson was a player, he was like organizing like yeah. preseason games and like making money doing that. <laughs> Very like wild west. <laughs> and so uh, we got the explanation because of course LeBron was complaining on Twitter about having to fly to Milwaukee, which I mean, if it's not LeBron, like I think that it would have been probably accepted as a more fair argument. Like it, it's kind of random. I mean, it but, is kind of strange, but yeah. Yeah. You know why you don't just, travel between you know detroit and chicago and indiana whatever maybe minnesota for preseason like I, I think everybody would agree that would probably be a more logical thing to do um but apparently this is like payback for when the bucks went to la last year yeah. um so I, I, I don't totally forgot about yeah me too but yeah that was the like yana saying like oh my god oh we're our pick and roll is going to be so unstoppable and yeah never seen anything with blah, blah blah it's like okay well, got a little bit ahead of ourselves there yeah and it was uh as we wrap here it it was very it was just very strange seeing in the the pregame pressers jj reddick at the podium as the head coach of the lakers and at one point even dave kind of leaned over to me and said like this is so weird that this guy is the coach of the lakers he and doc were both asked uh, I think it was Dave McMenamin that, that was asking the questions. Uh, they each took about three questions about the other. And what is that relationship like? Doc gave a pretty thoughtful answer about, you know, basically as a coach, you, you know that you're kind of the bad guy, that you can overcoach and you just pour into the players. And down the road, when they're a couple of years removed, usually some guys will circle back and say, you know, I guess I was wrong here in, in reference to his relationship with Rondo, that that was a guy that they butted heads a lot when you coached him. And now they're very, very close. Um, didn't give any impression that he and JJ Redick are there. He just kind of said, yeah, I guess we're fine. Uh, and said it was one-sided. And when JJ Redick was asked about it, clearly not happy and um, gave a one word answer about how are you and doc now? And just fine. And um, also added you know, I'm not the type of guy that carries beef with me, which I was stunned <laughs> there wasn't uproarious laughter in the room as soon as he said that. Well, Jesse, did you hear uh, his interview with Zach Lowe 
Uh, yes. Shout out to Zach Lowe. Um, the final one that Lowe did. Yeah. yeah, which still just, you know, if Zach Lowe can get laid off, really, truly anyone can. Um, <laughs> but uh, Zach asked him about, I forget the framing of it. I think it was Doc, like Doc was asked something about JJ. Oh, it was about quote unquote skipping the line or something like that. Yes. I, and it, actually, I don't think Doc necessarily said anything. No, it, he wasn't like yeah. saying that JJ skipped the line, but yeah. I think he was just sort of alluding, like you know, yeah, the assistant uh, coaches that have been waiting for this, and yeah, yeah, and um, and Reddick's response was, "I have no response." Like it was, it was like such a like annoyed, like, <laughs> like I don't think of you at all, you know, like that sort of thing. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I'm not mad. Don't, don't tell them I'm mad. Um, it was, it was just sort of strange. I don't know. JJ is, it's kind of weird. Cause on the one hand, I kind of liked him at, eight, at uh, ESPN because he had much more reasonable views. And I yes. think he, you could tell he saw through a lot of the BS of the shows he was on at ESPN. Yeah. And he's a thoughtful guy, you know, um, I, and I don't, I don't harbor any like ill will for his like Milwaukee stint. The, I know some no, people same. still whatever, yeah. but I, I don't really care. Yeah. I mean, if, if not for all that, just remember that horrible year was the year that gave us Giannis. Yeah, so yeah. it's, it worked out, but, um, um I, I will say this. I am, <laughs> I, I will admit to, I am, <laughs> I, I am rooting against him as a coach. <laughs> It's like strange. I can't really articulate why, but there's something kind of like smug and uppity about him, you know, and like <laughs> just some of his interactions. Cause like you can, t it's, it's going to be so interesting because a, like talking about setup to fail, like that, that job, like anybody taking that job is it's so hard. Cause they, you know, you're expected to compete for a championship and obviously the talent like does not seem to be set up to do that. Right. I mean, they have talent, but it's, it's tough. I mean, LeBron's 40, you know, um, AD is AD. Uh, so I don't know. On the one hand, um, he's, he, that's a really tough job to take, but it is interesting because I think he, you know, he's not going to be like a bud who's just going to turn the other cheek and just not give any real answers, whatever. Right. Like he's, he's going to be aware of all the noise. And, you know, like we saw it the other day, somebody asked him about, you know, what was that Rui Hachimura? Like, what does it take for him to take the next step? And yes. he kind of like What's got really like step? what got does really, that mean? Got yeah. really snippy with him. And it's just like, <laughs> I mean, I kind of get it. Like, there's a lot of bad questions that people ask, but I feel like when you've been around the block, you realize that just I, I don't know what the point <laughs> of like picking fights <laughs> and trying to make, you know, reporters look bad. Like it, it it's just there's gonna be a ton of pressure on him. And he seems like kind of guy, like it's going to be hard for him to not to mask how he's truly feeling. Yeah. And so I, I think that's probably, you know, what, what, you know, people, and, and again, like doc's interesting. Cause like doc, I mean, doc talks too much. Let's be honest. Like it's great for, <laughs> it's great for the media, but like, you know, it gets him into trouble. Sometimes it'd probably be better for him if he just said less um, versus a guy like bud who, you know, just doesn't really say anything and is perfectly polite, but doesn't really give you anything. I mean, that's probably, you know, if I was going to give PR coaching to coaches, <laughs> I would probably say just do what Mike Budenholzer does. Like maybe, or, or just, you know, be a little more disarming to yeah. your personality because that was the big takeaway of like, I don't carry any beef with me. And, um, and then when he was really pressed on the doc issue, um, because that's the fascinating part about all of this is I think it was, uh, I forget who brought it up, but like, <laughs> What makes you unique is, you know, not so much that you were playing recently, but you've been doing media up until this year. Like Steve Nash was not doing TV shows and then took the Nets job. So that's what makes this unique. And, and he was even asked of, are, are you concerned or is there anything you had to go through and scrub of some of the takes you've had and things that you've had to say in the past year or two and knowing now I may be coaching or going up against some of these guys. And you could tell he was very upset at that question too and was quick to clarify and point out when when I forget how it was phrased, but like the back and forth that you had with Doc. And he very quickly interjected and said, it wasn't a back and forth. It was one comment that I made on first take. 
and uh, like immediately defensive where you just got the sense of, oh yeah, this is not good <laughs> between yeah. the two of them. And this is going to be fascinating to see if things start to go wrong. Yeah. I don't know. We will see. That's uh, that's all I'll say. We will see. Uh, Monday night, preseason game number three, the Bucks and the Bulls. Hopefully we see Curse Middleton, uh, Doc. Kind of what, what we said about the uh, Malik Beasley comps in the way Adrian Griffin talked him up last year to what we're hearing from Doc about uh, Gary Trent Jr. It is starting to feel very, very reminiscent of last year with Chris, but we'll see if Chris Middleton is uh, on the floor Monday when the Bucks take on the Bulls. Any final thoughts as we wrap here, Frank? No, let's bring on, bring on one more game and try to get through it healthy and hell if we can see – Chris Middleton in any preseason action, I will call that a huge win. And um, but at a minimum, it doesn't seem like he's far off. Far, so yeah. you know, like let's just say my my anxiety about the Bucks roster slash health, especially with regard to Chris, is I would say has been sort of just trending down steadily <laughs> over the past you know couple months. So that's I'll call that a positive. But until he's back on the floor, you know. Did it bottom look, out when you saw Dame like roll the ankle in the first quarter? Today? Well, fortunately, he didn't go down and like yeah. grab his Achilles or something like that. But um, it was not. It was just like, ah, oh, here we go. All right, can't. We, this is why we can't have nice things. But um, we we can at least have regular season basketball sooner. So I like that. soon, soon. Uh, it's a good place to wrap it. So the Bucks come up short in preseason game number two, but uh, some bright spots from AJ Johnson and obviously Giannis and Bobby Portis. For Frank, I'm Justin. We will talk to you once again next week on Locked On Bucks.